So my name is Nathaniel Yishak and I've started Untap Excellence today. We've actually launched it in the headquarters of Investec Asset Management because I really believe that we need a platform for solutions to be created for Africa. My name is Duncan Coombe. Uh, I'm the head of organization development at Investec Asset Management. Uh, and my background is that I've done uh, a whole bunch of roles here at Investec from selling uh, to marketing. Uh, and now I'm responsible for uh, part of the human and capital area which is organization development and then the other thing that I do is that I teach at a business school so um, I teach leadership teach team development uh, anything to do with people in organizations but Nathaniel contacted me uh, a few months ago in fact probably about a year ago uh, and uh, one thing led to another I was taken by his passion his enthusiasm his vision uh, and so when he said could he host the event here at Investec Asset Management of course we said yes with great pleasure Just to give you a brief overview of why I'm here today, I actually have had a passion for, for starting this business from the age of 16. I'm 23 years of age and I've had a passion to do this for so many years. You know, from a young age I've always stuck uh, an A4 paper on my bedroom and I said one day I'm going to start a business that can help to solve problems on, on the African continent. And I'm so happy to see you here today and I believe that today is the manifestation of that dream. And just to tell you a bit about the philanthropy side of what we're doing, I actually have a vision to build a school in Ethiopia under Untapped Excellence. And I really believe that Ethiopia is such an amazing country and I'm so glad to have the Ambassador's Excellency here. With more push in entrepreneurship, it could be the home of entrepreneurship in Africa. The banking industry generally um, and certainly out, you know, in the Anglo-Saxon world, if you like, you know, in the developed economies, isn't, doesn't have the best reputation at the moment, and it hasn't for 10 years now, it doesn't have the best standing as a contributor of sus uh, positive societal development in the world, uh, and of course that's because of the crash. Uh, 2007, 2008. Mobile banking technology is now ubiquitous, just like mobile phones have become over the last 10 years, uh, smartphones. So this is what I think is something positive for either customers, consumers, or investors in Africa to take note of. The fact is, investing in the banking space makes much more sense uh, you know, in digital, digital banking in Africa than it would say in the UK, where they're up against it. There's this expression, challenger banks. Uh, and I, I'm very familiar personally with a number of senior executives in, you know, Starling Bank, Atom Bank, you know, Oak North Bank. I know them personally, you know, one or two of them are close personal friends, but they're up against it. I, I don't know anyone who banks with a challenger bank. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm loving to meet one. I, I lecture at uh, Kent University, and this year's module, there were 60 students in my class. These are people in their 20s from all around the world. They've all got a UK bank account. And I said, which one of you doesn't bank with the high street banks. There's 60 students from all around the world. One chap, Indonesian chap, puts his hand up. And I said, who do you bank with? He goes, Halifax. I said, that's <laughs> noise. So in other words, and these are 20-somethings. If the challenger bank can't attract 20-somethings, they're up against it. In Africa, it's different. There is much more potential for a mobile app bank to make inroads in terms of consumers raising customer funding in Africa than it is in the UK. So that's what you're on to say. I'm saying there's a real positive power of the financial services sector to help society to do good work in Africa precisely because this technology is now becoming so so ubiquitous, it's available to everyone. Part of the work uh, you know, that we also supported in, in, in my standard charter days and a lot of the things that we're trying to do under the Eight Miles private equity umbrella is around uh, skills development and making and empowering people not through technology but just by giving them a chance and, and helping them learn and develop in the way that makes them more successful in the in the modern economy that is being developed in, in Africa. Um, so from my current hat, which is an equity hat, I think it's much easier to have that sort of impact because you're a shareholder. There's a limit to how much a bank can influence a company that it lends money to and it, I mean, it practically can't do anything. Um, and you know, yes, you can sort of create uh, support programs or financial literacy programs or whatever for a general sort of upskilling of the society. But you can't go to a bank that you've lent ten million uh, to a company that you've lent ten million dollars to and say, 
you know, please change the way you run your HR department to upskill people. You can't. But as private equity, I can do that. Yeah. So it's a completely different level of influence that one has when you're doing private equity. Of course, we're a small fund, but when you add up, you know, all the private equity money that's going into Africa, which is in the billions of dollars, and the numbers of companies that are being impacted by it, I think you will find a, a completely sort of different mindset at work. And the good thing, again, as you said, banking has a bad reputation, but private equity in the West has an even worse reputation, <laughs> right? Which is all they do is cut cost, strip assets, and double their money and fire you know half the workforce in the process. That's kind of a Western private equity. Um, whereas I think in Africa, private equity is actually trying to do the right thing. Now, part of it one could argue is because the DFIs are the major investors in African private equity. It's not the it's not just private sector institutions. And DFIs like CDC, FMO, DEG all have a huge <coughs> sort of development agenda and insist on you know private equity funds adopting that agenda. So whether it's a top down imposition by DFIs or whether it's you know the private equity fund itself deciding that this is the right thing to do. There's a lot of push to to make PE funds do the right thing uh, in Africa, which doesn't exist, I think, in PE funds in any in any other market. There's so much expertise in the room. It will be interesting to hear what people are thinking about. What else is going on? What are you interested in? What are you curious about? What do you want to say? Yeah, uh, Tom Asimura, I head the international listings business at the London Stock Exchange. Uh, I've been there for about four years, um, and before that, an uh, equity capital markets banker at Citigroup for about 15 years uh, for my sins. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, well, after <laughs> <laughs> Africa has always been a huge sort of passion of mine, yeah. um, and, uh, and it's been great to be part of some of the London Stock Exchange's initiatives uh, in that part of the world. You know, we have the, the privilege and, and history, if you like, of, of actually being the second largest African stock exchange after the JSE by, by number of companies, yeah. um, which is great, but it doesn't get anywhere close to answering some of the challenges here around SMEs, around that, that sort of funding gap. How are we going to get that sort of lifeblood of entrepreneurial activity in Africa uh, funded? Um, and so there are a couple of things we're, we're, we're doing, and uh, I'm not saying it's, it's all going to change the world or it's, it's all going to uh, work perfectly, uh, but I think we're going in the right direction. So um, we have a, a program called Elite for Scaling Businesses, uh, which we've run very successfully in our home markets uh, in around the UK, Italy, and the continent of Europe, which we've just, uh, just the last year, we've licensed to the Casablanca Exchange in Morocco, which is really our sort of test case. And that's gone very well. There are 50 companies now as part of that program. And we're looking now at other partners around Africa that we could launch similar um, uh, sort of programs to, to mentor companies, to help them know, understand the sources of finance that are out there, help them think through uh, their options, and help them get prepared for exactly that you know, capital raising conversation. So that when they go into the private yes. equity conversation, they know what the investor is going to ask. They prepare their business plan. They've got their, 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 their things together. Um, so that I think is one thing that we're doing. It's a it's a sort of slow rollout, um, and and a lot is about finding the right partners to, to drive that in different markets and understanding that what works in Morocco won't work in Nigeria, won't work in. <coughs> South Africa, you know, you need to have a, a very different approach. So, but that's one area. The other area, which I just wanted to highlight, um, this is not, by the way, an advert, but mm. I encourage you to have a look at it, um, is we have, um, over the last few years, run a, a number of um, publications called, call it sort of Thousand Companies um, series. Thousand Companies to Inspire Britain has just had its fourth um, publication, really to shine a light on exciting SMEs in, in the market. Uh, hopefully, not all roads are going to lead to Rome. Capital markets aren't going to be the answer for everyone. But I, I hope you know we can play our role in helping join the dots for some of those smaller businesses in the future. So in the Chatham House of the Royal International Affairs Think Tank, um, I developed and run a program that develops future healthcare leaders. I'm in the sense of global health security, health policy is my, is my passion. And you picked up on um, the skills development needed for, for some of the 
leaders to actually enact the change that we're discussing and, and for it to happen. And we have that similar view at Chatham House where our fellowship program supports um, senior managers um, in West Africa and gives them the tools and develops their leadership ability to really have impact on the ground. My question is, um, we have a theoretical framework and a way that we pitch the fellowship to them. You know, we take them to Geneva, for example, to meet people in WTO, WHO. We network them with colleagues here at DFID and so on and so forth to understand the global health landscape and be better healthcare leaders. Um, we have a theoretical underpinning that, that informs our curriculum and so on and so forth. What's the theoretical underpinning um, or framework that you think finance leaders need in, in Africa to develop their economic story? Um, it's, leadership is really interesting as a field, as a business in the last 20 years and it's got two very strong elements and one that has historically been missed that I think is, needs to come back in terms of this conversation. So the dominant idea within um, leadership, executive education, skills development has come from psychology. But that psychology is is good old classic Western psychology, and then it's in, and and so you get a lot of sort of self awareness kind of, and then there's a lot of just management training, how to run a meeting, how to you know how to just be effective or efficient in organizing an organization, both of which are necessary. But the thing that has been really skipped has been the normative view until just the last little while. What actually is the purpose of leadership? What are you leading towards? And typically your business school professor would say, not my question. I'll deal with self-awareness and I'll help you be more, more effective, but your mission or purpose or why are you doing this is not the business school's concern or academia's concern. And that's the piece that in I think in leadership training needs to be reminded of people and brought back into leadership training is, is it's not just a set of functional skills or self-management. It is also um, being serious about what am I trying to achieve in the world and can I do that in a better way? And, then, uh, and I'd love to know if anyone's got a program aimed really at the bottom of the pyramid uh, you know, type of, uh, of, of, of segment. Uh, that would be very impactful, but but I do think they are. I, I, I yes, there is a bit of an elite bias, but I do think people are trying to go down a bit. Okay, I have a question. Uh, my question, Akim. Uh, my name is Akim from Stambika VTC uh, in Lagos. My question is: there are few um, impact investment funds that are saying they're looking at Africa right now. What's your view about that? Do you really think? They're going to make. I think there might be somebody here from an impact fund. Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> so, yeah, so, what we're involved in on the private equity side is uh, off grid home, home systems where instead of someone's uh, a family spending 50 cents a day on kerosene and they're going to charge their cell phone and spend the same amount of money and over several years pay off the solar home system that provides lighting. That's huge. A lot of interesting technologies that are coming out now and that we tend to associate with cutting edge finance. But I think that in this environment, they will be very, very powerful. We can find a way to translate because they're very distributed and engaging in a variety of people. So, one example of that is everything that's coming around the blockchain. So, we tend to think about blockchain associated with fintech and cutting edge finance technology. But one of the powers of the blockchain is a distributed ledger with the fact that you can identify unique transactions in a distributed way. So just to give you an example, I saw an amazing application of this technology to sell concert tickets, you know, here in the developed world that immediately at the Nibiru College, they raised 20 million um, you know, pounds immediately to support that because it had an immediate impact. Now, think about the same idea applied to payments and to simple contracts in an environment such as Africa, where enabling a distributed population to be associated with these very different and low-key things. There is an immense opportunity, so I think one of the things in terms of promoting entrepreneurship that I think could be very powerful to Africa is to try to think about some things that are emerging in terms of the entrepreneurial mindset 
trying to make headway in the developed world and think about some of them that could potentially be much more interesting and develop much quicker oh, and yeah. much, m be much more in sync with some of the needs that are happening there, just like the stories that you told and that I completely agree that happened with the cell phone. We have to remind ourselves that cell phones and the ability to charge and the discharge minutes on the cell phone became the standard way to transfer money between people in the variety of these countries in the Philippines and many other places in Africa, you know, way ahead even of the existence of real mobile banking to share it, right? That was the way to transfer money between many different people. So people find a way, if you find a very interesting platform over the cell phones to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Very great ideas, vision for Africa. Thank you, Fabian, so for sharing these interesting ideas with us. Africa is very young. 70% of the population is below 35 years old. And therefore, the importance of uh, creating this is uh, involving the young, the young ones, the boys and girls, the young men and women, not only in the urban centers, but also in the rural areas as well. And I was wondering whether we could involve the diaspora, the African diaspora, in Britain or in Europe or in other countries uh, in, this, in this project so that uh, we can have the skills transfer, the knowledge transfer, and uh, inspiring the, the youth. And therefore, um, the attitude is very important. Attitude and change is very important. And university graduates might not like to go into small businesses, but that's how we can succeed in that if we start small to grow in the I would just really want to say I've been very touched by this evening. I think it's been an amazing time and I think this is the first event I've been to that it, it, we've struggled to stop it. Like, yeah, 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 but it's been an amazing experience. And thank you so much for coming, and thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much, guys. Really. So, what I've really enjoyed about this evening and taken away from it is to be reminded of all of the good stories about Africa, African companies, African stories of success. Um, and for me, a lot of this is about narrative, it's about network, it's about community. And so to spend some time with a group of people who are positive, engaged, enthusiastic, active, having impact in Africa, uh, it's just a really good experience. The main thing I took away from this debate is that anyone can be a solution provider to Africa. You don't have to be a big leader you don't have to be a CEO you could be anyone but just have the mindset of someone that wants to provide solutions so I really believe that you watching me wherever you might be or whatever you might be doing have a think about how you can provide solutions for Africa and you can visit us on our website untapped-excellence.com